in these bleak times, I have decided to run for truth and justice, which takes the form of running for president of the United States as a candidate for the People's Party. I enter in the quest for truth. I enter in the quest for justice. And the presidency is just one vehicle to pursue that truth and justice, what I've been trying to do all of my life. The Grange movement in the 1800s was an agrarian political movement among farmers who were fed up with the corporate monopoly over grain. Terence Powderly was a labor organizer in the late 1800s, most responsible for making the Knights of Labor a national movement. Along the way, farmers would unite with the labor movement, join forces with socialists and progressive free silver activists looking to break the wealthy stranglehold over gold. This alchemy of interests gradually became known as the Popular Alliance. Their platform was known as the Omaha Platform, and it included some familiar ideas like increasing the money supply in order to make it easier to pay down personal debt, an eight-hour workday, nationalizing railroads, taxing the rich, and mostly reining in corporate power. Like other upstart movements and parties, some of the bigger ideas were indeed incorporated into the American two-party political apparatus. Ideas such as an eight-hour workday, income tax on the wealthy, and the direct election of senators, for example, all conceived in the populist alliance and codified by the early progressive movement under Republican Teddy Roosevelt and his successor. Today, one of my favorite public intellectuals, Dr. Cornell West, announced his candidacy for the President of the United States. He's running under the banner of the People's Party, which credits much of its platform to the legacy of the populist alliance. While I don't normally comment on topics like this immediately, the idea of Cornell West on the national stage is just too tempting to pass up. Now, listeners of the podcast will understand why this is a complicated issue for me and might even be a little more forgiving of my gut reaction and my analysis than a leftist or a social democrat just discovering you in FTR. This moment is the ultimate what-if proposition that challenges my underlying thesis of political organization in this country. But first, let's talk about Cornell West. UNFTR. I first became aware of West during the Occupy movement, and my only regret is that I missed out on decades of his teaching and advocacy and had to play catch up. And what attracted me to him was his stunning rebuke of Barack Obama. Well, one, I think that it's morally obscene and spiritually profane to spend $6 billion on an election, $2 billion on a presidential election and not have any serious discussion. Poverty, trade unions being pushed against the wall, dealing with stagnating and declining wages when profits are still up and the 1% are doing very well. No talk about drones dropping bombs on innocent people. So we end up with such a narrow, truncated political discourse as the major problems, ecological catastrophe, climate change, global warming. So it's very sad. I mean, I'm glad there was not a right-wing takeover. But we end up with a Republican, a Rockefeller Republican in blackface with uh, Barack Obama. So that our struggle in regard to poverty intensifies. That's a pretty rough assessment of President Obama. West remained a steadfast critic throughout the Obama years and beyond. He called Obama's liberal use of drone strikes a war crime, said he was right of Nixon on health care and the environment criticized him for propping up the establishment and failing to prosecute executives on Wall Street. And he was transparent all along that he was doing it because he's an honest broker. And it cost him. He lost a lot of friends in the liberal establishment. But unlike other fame-seeking pseudo-intellectuals and pundits who fall out of favor with their base of support, he didn't adapt to these circumstances and appeal to another audience. No Patreon, no Substack, no fake Twitter wars, no manufactured drama, just honest talk, holy and secular dialogue that speaks truth to power. I probably don't need to run through West's pedigree, but for anyone not closely familiar with his biography, here are some highlights. Magna cum laude from Harvard undergrad in three years. Got a master's and a PhD from Princeton. Has written 20 books, spoken all over the world. Is an ordained Baptist minister. Has taught religion, black history, philosophy, politics. Can talk about the classics or music, from jazz to pop culture an intellectual in the truest sense. And because my admiration runs deep for him, I have a lot of feelings about this announcement. 
especially considering how we've covered Marianne Williamson and RFK Jr., Bernie Sanders as an independent on the Democratic line, the idea of third parties in general. The candidacy of Cornell West is precisely what my heart wants. And it's precisely what I've been advocating against since the beginning of UNFTR. So this is an opportunity to kind of hash it out and use a figure that I have a great deal of respect for to illustrate my point. First, let's talk about pragmatism. In terms of policies, I consider myself a leftist. For example, I support getting money out of politics, would like to ban corporate lobbying, guarantee quality education, housing, paid leave, and a living wage to all, curb inflation, support unions, and expand Social Security, create a national single-payer health care system, lower drug prices, and abolish medical debt, bring our troops home, and invest those trillions of war dollars into American communities. Guarantee equal rights to all Americans, restore free speech, protect choice, end the drug war, and abolish mass incarceration. Clean up pollution in our food, water, and air. Tackle climate change and shift to regenerative agriculture. Also, that's word for word the platform of the People's Party, save for two things that I'm not really in support of, and that's term limits in Congress and hand-counted paper ballots. On the former, if you go with ranked choice voting, get money out of politics, eliminate corporate lobbying, and eliminate gerrymandering, you'll get a better class of elected official, and institutional knowledge is profoundly important. Tenure has merits. And with respect to hand-counted paper ballots, it's not 1870. But on everything else, and feel free to change my mind on the paper ballot thing, by the way, but I will argue all day against term limits. On everything else, I'm completely and wholeheartedly aligned with the core platform of the People's Party that appears on their one-page WordPress site doesn't even have a favicon. And that's fine. The organization was founded by a former Bernie outreach organizer named Nick Branna, and it was originally formed as a draft Bernie movement in 2017 by former campaign staffers. Branna's profile claims that the nonprofit group was founded in 2017 as MPP officially and now boasts 60,000 members. So I tried to look them up on ProPublica or GuideStar, the IRS database, and I couldn't find any information. No tax filings, nothing. So. I decided to donate to the website to see what the receipt said. And the website just said, thanks. So technically, the organization is a 527 org, which means it would have to file what's known as a Form 8871. It's like a 990 for a nonprofit, but for a political group. Unless it takes in less than $25,000 a year, in which case you don't have to. So assuming the MPP isn't a rogue and derelict organization, because they have Cornell West running at the top of their ticket... I'll also assume that it has to take in less than $25,000 a year. Considering the amount of money spent during the 2020 election cycle was $14 billion, I'd say the MPP has a little ways to go. Does this sound snarky and mean so far? I hope not. And then again, I do. It's a reality check. But hey, every movement has to start somewhere. Well, just look at the other third party options in this country, like the Working Families Party or the Libertarian Party, Conservative Party the Constitution Party, the Green Party, the Independence Party, the Moderate Party, the Mountain Party, the Peace and Freedom Party, Progressive Democratic Party, Tea Party. So many parties! I sure hope I'm invited, but what will I wear? In order for these parties to run candidates in local, state, or federal elections, they have to first get on a ballot. And that takes a lot of money and organizing, outreach. All of these other parties have been doing it for years. And now the People's Party is just now jumping into the game with arguably one of the greatest American intellectuals in our little history. <sighs> Some good news is that they were able to get on the ballot in the not-so-great state of Florida, where at least they're mandated to file campaign finance disclosures, so it's here that we get our first glimpse of the organization and the fundraising prowess of the People's Party. For the last election cycle, they were able to raise and back their candidates with a grand total of $1,700. So, one state down, 49 to go. Plus DC, Puerto Rico, and American Samoa. Hey, we're on our way, right? And look, I get it, I really do. I get the urge to stick it in the eye of the two-party system and go with a third party, even a new one. Forget that the working families and Green Party platforms are incredibly similar and already appear on a ballot in multiple states and even have a handful of successes at the state levels. There's always room in the political system, right? Wrong. Why? 
because we're out of time. The IPCC set the global emissions fail point at 1.5 degrees from where we are right now. And they're projecting that we're going to get there in just a matter of a few years, which is faster than they originally thought. The planet is doomed, and so are we if we spend our time tilting at windmills trying to break the duopoly system in the United States. Now, as listeners to the pod have heard me say, and criticize me for it, our only expedient hope is to build grassroots coalitions on the ground to infect and overwhelm the Democratic establishment specifically because of the sophistication and enormity of the political apparatus. This war needs to be waged on the inside, a hostile takeover that gives progressives, and I mean true progressives, the levers of power. They need more than just a handful of chips for bargaining power at the table. We need to run the table. You don't get to do that by opening up a competing casino down the road with no bathrooms, running water, or table games, just a handful of slot machines and a BYOB sign. As the World Socialist website said of the MPP in the most blunt way possible, quote, the MPP is an example of the type of formation produced by an extremely low level of political consciousness. It is somewhat difficult to comment on because it is not a serious organization. The term party is purely nominal. A party is based on a common program, a common assessment of historical experiences, and a common perspective. The MPP has none of these. It does not understand the past, it has nothing to offer for the present, and it has no future, end quote. As I said with respect to Marianne Williamson and RFK Jr. damaging the progressive brand and wasting our time on demagoguery, this isn't a game. And I get it that there are still a bunch of disaffected Bernie supporters out there that are still miffed at how the DNC undercut Bernie, not once but twice. I'm one of them. But his campaigns were successful enough to have pretty long coattails that have taken the Progressive Caucus in Congress from a handful of members to nearly 100. And that number will continue to grow if we do this right. But when you let people like Williamson and Kennedy chip away at our attention, people with literally no political experience or inclination that they can build organizations and coalitions, we're tampering with the most expedient method to move progressive ideals forward. So what are we to make of Cornell West? Does he fall into the same category? Well, yes and no. Had West thrown his hat into the ring as a Democrat running on a socialist platform like Bernie, but even further left, I'm all in. What's the difference between him and Williamson or Kennedy? Credibility, consistency. He's not remotely conspiratorial. He's honest, pragmatic, and schooled in political science. His grasp of issues is rooted in intellectual and doctrinal teachings. He's built coalitions of support and supporters and worked closely with labor organizations, poverty relief organizations, and economic councils. He's not a demagogue. He's a leader, one who's willing to sacrifice his popularity in favor of principle, and yet one who's willing to walk into the lion's den armed with only his wit, wisdom, and words. I've watched him debate Peter Thiel, Bill O'Reilly, Bill Maher, Laura Ingram, Tucker Carlson, and he does it with love addressing them all as brother and sister without ever seeming patronizing. He's an artful and moving communicator who works feverishly on behalf of the working class, the poverty-stricken, the disenfranchised, the abused, the demoralized, not just here, but around the world. He's one of the few people who can stand up against anti-Semitism while condemning Israel's treatment of the Palestinian people and actually gets all sides to listen. His messages are grounded in secularism and shrouded in morality, carefully cultivated in the black prophetic tradition of Frederick Douglass. As he's often said, it was Douglass and the abolitionists who pulled Lincoln to the right side of history. Eleanor Roosevelt who pulled FDR to the right side of history. And it was Dr. King who pulled LBJ to the right side of history. And in each instance, the right side is always left. Cornell West deserves more than a nascent platform with zero transparency, one balloted state, and $1,700 in the bank. Cornell West is a treasure, a global treasure, who should be platformed at the highest level possible. We don't need more political parties. We need leftists to rout establishment Dems on the local level, to dominate primary after primary, and force the nation to the left in order to save the planet. Here endeth the screed.